Good morning to you all. We have a couple of readings this morning. The first is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And the second reading is from Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 through 22. Woe to you, blind guides, you say. If anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath, you blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing but anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath, you blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and the ones who dwell in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Here ends this morning's readings. Thank you, Dominic. Well, every week I think, oh, it'll be a little bit lighter this week. I was glad to get through uh, with some pretty heavy stuff uh, in previous week's sermons. And, uh, and then I got to this one, I thought, oh, Yes, yes, no, no, that, that one's easy. Um, but the more that you read and, and the more that you let God kind of work on your response to that reading, you've, you realize that there's nothing easy in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, there's nothing easy about it at all. And uh, perhaps there's a lot of reasons that we can begin to understand why the Jews, uh, in particular maybe the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, had trouble accepting a lot of Jesus' teachings because we have trouble accepting them too. And what I find challenging to me is I want to encourage you each week and build you up and make you feel the hope and the joy and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus is that I'm bringing you teachings from Jesus each week that are convicting, that might make you feel guilty. And, uh, and guilt isn't really popular in the church um, these days. And, um, and I don't want like, you know, okay, so this is in my tenure at the King of Prussia Church, the first few months is just Paul hitting me over the head with more difficult stuff that I have to feel guilty about. Um, but I'm just going, I'm going to keep telling this, I'm just going through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm just sharing what Jesus uh, was, felt was at the core, you know, of, of his ministry and of us being citizens of his kingdom. This is the way we're supposed to live. And, um, and so, it is what it is. He's the messenger. And what I'm going to do today is try to make you feel guilty. Um, because I think just, just reading that, you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't say swear to God. I don't say, you know, I, I don't swear anything. I'm pretty much a yes or no person. Um, and uh, I actually might think that about myself until I start to take the context that they were in and say, okay, what context do we have that's similar? And then I saw myself. And that's what I want for you, is that each week you would have the experience I get to have during the week um, that I share, and it culminates in you having the same painful experience. And so that's, that's my goal today, um, is that you'll feel a little bit pained, uh, but that you'll know the answer for your pain. You'll know what to do. So uh, Mark Twain is one of my favorite people. Um, you know, when you read great people in literature, it's not that they're all, you know, disciples of Christ and, and they've all got wonderful wisdom to share about the gospel, but God, by this wonderful grace and mercy that he shows to everyone, gives all kinds of people wisdom to share. And Mark Twain had so many nuggets of wisdom uh, that are so good for us to dwell upon. But this one, he said, and uh, this one you've probably heard, uh, it gets twisted and like you know, paraphrased lots of places online, but he said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Everybody knows what that means, right? 
Everybody's had the experience of having to remember what version of the story did I tell that person? What excuse did I give? Where did I say I was? Right, when my parents asked me last time. Um, all of those things, we've had those experiences, trying to remember. And we've all had the experiences of like forgetting and then later on saying, was I consistent? Did I say the same thing this time? Because we're trying to protect ourselves by being dishonest. And the Pharisees, in the context of these passages, were doing some of that, trying to protect themselves when they would swear an oath, when they would uh, you know, uh, promise to do something. So we're going to uncover what they were up to. This guy, Oscar Wilde, this is an English literature uh, lesson today. He's a playwright. You guys have probably heard his name before. Very funny guy uh, with a lot of insight into human nature. He said, if you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. Right? So that's why every week when I preach, I hope that I get some laughs early in the sermon. Then when I deliver the tough stuff, you're like, I kind of like him, though. He's not so bad. He didn't, you know. And that's, that's how politicians work, right? That's how people who are really, uh, you know, persuasive work. They try to get you to feel good about them by you laugh, and then there's this thing that happens in your brain physiologically. It's like a drug, and then you're under their spell. And um, that's what I'm doing. So, no, that's, that, this is really good insight, though. When we tell people tough things, if we make them laugh, it'll go down a little bit easier, right? They might be okay with it, especially if we can laugh at ourselves. Sometimes with this topic of being dishonest, we laugh at ourselves a little too much, and then we don't take it seriously. We ask the question in the church building often, all of us can identify with this, right? And we're all like, yeah, I can identify with it. And then we kind of laugh and chuckle at how silly we are, and we think it's really not that big of a deal because everybody else is doing it. And we're all in it together, and God's good all the time. He forgives me. So we don't take it seriously enough sometimes. But it's okay to laugh at how foolish we are as long as it becomes reverence for a God who gives us the wisdom to be different. And uh, there's this conversation that I... I really enjoy uh, that John includes that I, you can't get in this detail in the other Gospels. So much, I often tell people to read John when they ask me which Gospel to read if they haven't read one, uh, because John's just so different than the other three. Um, I think reading all four is good. But this particular interchange comes from John chapter 18, where Jesus is before Pilate. He's going through this illegal trial, these proceedings that really make a mockery of justice. And in the conversation, Jesus, or uh, Pilate asked Jesus in verse 33, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. And we don't know what his tone was when he asked the question, but there had to be some level of cynicism in there. Uh, at least I really think so. What is truth? And I think we live in a culture where that's, that's the question, isn't it? What is truth? And there is an extent to which if you watch the television, there's so many different points of view. If you listen to talk radio, and everybody quotes different statistics, different arguments, and in the end, you're left going, I don't know what's true. I don't know if I can trust any of these people. Everybody says something different. Uh, medical advice even changes constantly. So there's a sense in which we've kind of gotten to the point where a lot of people just really feel like maybe we don't know what's true anymore. And uh, it's nothing new that people would feel that way. It's a world of a lot of diverse ideas, a lot of it generated by our own desires and created out of our sinful nature. And those things compete with what's really true. And, uh, but this is a question Pilate asks, and I think that we have a real problem with truth, whether it's that kind of propositional truth or just honesty in general. Uh, there's this bill uh, that it's a 
the House of Representatives has this bill that has not been passed into law, I don't think, in this, I looked for it trying to find it as a law, but I only found it as a bill. But I'd heard of it. It's truth in advertising. And um, you can't read that, I'm sure. Oh, maybe some of you sit up in the front. I can't read it back there. But the purpose is to do this. It's a strategy to reduce the use in advertising and other media for the promotion of commercial products of images that have been altered to materially change the physical characteristics of the faces and bodies of the individuals depicted. It's the Photoshop law, <laughs> like airbrushing, right? It's so that women can feel better about their figures. I'm not sure. Anybody, you get what I'm saying? You go through, none of that's real. Those ladies who look like that, that's not, that's not real. None of it's real. If you met any of them in person, they wouldn't look that way. Um, I'm not sure why this law exists, or this bill is being, I don't know what the agenda is with it. I kind of like it. Can you imagine what it would be like if this was enforced, if this became law, that pictures had to tell the truth? Now this particularly references uh, images of any kind. It does mention face and bodies. I'm not sure if it just means people, but I know when I go to a fast food restaurant, I've never gotten what's on the picture. <laughs> Have you? Anybody ever had that experience? How would it change if what it really looks like is what was on the picture? Would you, would you order it? Would you pay $9 for it? Probably not. I'd pay $9 for what's in the picture. Um, there is something important about this idea, but we kind of laugh because it's just ridiculous. We know it's never going to happen. Truth in advertising? The whole purpose of advertising is, generally speaking, to persuade people, no matter whether what you're selling will do it for them or not, that their message is reality. So, uh, and a lot of it's subliminal, right? It's just kind of subtle, it's just implied. But if we just watched commercials today, which I thought about doing, and then I thought, oh, we'll have trouble with the video and it won't go well. Um, but they're, they're always promising something. How often do they deliver in your experience? Sometimes the commercials tell the truth, but the implication that the things, the place we take it, like in terms of our dreams and what that product will do for us, or what that thing in our life will do for us, goes well beyond the commercial. They plant the seed and we take it to a whole other place as far as what we think that, that product will do for us. And then it almost always disappoints. Almost always. That's why Christmas is such a lousy holiday. Because everything that a child wishes for and believes will change his or her life leaves them feeling empty. And sometimes that very day, they're already there, like, this is all it is? <laughs> what a wonderful, just microcosm of what life is like for all of us, even as adults. Just about everything other than communion with our God, the truest, sweetest fellowship with Him leaves us saying, everything else leaves us saying, is this all there is? Is this all it is? Trust, truth, integrity. These are the words I think of when I look at faces and uh, the political realm. How about you? I couldn't look at any pictures of people who are currently being talked about and running for uh, president, which starts way too early. Like, I keep thinking, oh, the elections are... No, they're not. We're like, <laughs> we're really far away from elections. But it's all everybody's talking about. Because uh, everyone wants to believe that something, you know, there's going to be hope in the next person or change or something will be different. And we keep believing that despite all evidence to the contrary. Right? We don't have a lot of evidence that who we elect for president is going to really make much of a positive impact on our lives or our local communities. But I'm still passionate about getting the right person there. But when it comes to truth, do we really look at any candidate and say, I'll vote for him because I think I can trust him 100%. Like, I really believe that every word he says in that debate or in his stump speeches, he's going to follow through on. Sometimes when they're really charming, we get to that place. But experience tells us that people just say things. They just say things because they get them results in the moment. If I can get the right affect out of you, if I can get you to feel good or like me or whatever, it doesn't matter whether I follow through on it later as long as I get what I need right now. This is how politicians operate. You get into office and then nobody ever then runs really on their accomplishments when they go for re-election because there usually aren't any. They just continue to hope that their charm and their rhetoric will convince you to feel a certain way about them. But truth is almost never spoken. And candidates who just speak plainly don't win. 
because those who don't speak plainly and who are deceiving make them look naive and inexperienced just because they're telling the truth. And we as Christians have to be prepared that telling the truth comes with a cost. There's a price to telling the truth. The rewards are wonderful, but telling the truth is very risky. And so we need to just kind of know up front that we will probably be mocked if we're honest. We will probably end up losing opportunities in life because of our honesty, because not everybody responds with grace to the truth. In this place, hopefully if we tell the truth, we're well received. That better be said about our church family. But in the world, if we tell the truth, it's not always going to go well with us. I think on the most important basic level, telling the truth is about relationship. And this really looks like a Facebook thing to me. And the, the, the missing apostrophe bothers me greatly. But I was, in fact, the whole thing feels juvenile. But, but at the same time, there's, this is pretty much what it's all about. All I'm saying is never lie to me. Everything else can be worked out. Isn't that how it works in human relationships? When trust is broken, what do we have? Not just, you know, not just in a marriage relationship, in any friendship, in a professional relationship. If, if I have a client and I'm not honest with them, what do I have left? They find out they can't trust me, it's over. It's very unlikely I can fix that. This is so important in human relationship, and this is why it's important to God. Why does it matter that God is truth? Why does it matter that he doesn't lie? I can't have a relationship with a God who lies. I can't have a relationship with someone like the Roman and Greek gods and goddesses. I need to know that I can trust him. And God dwells in relationship, doesn't he? in his own person, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There has to be truth and unity and integrity in that relationship, or he's not worth worshiping, and they can't have unity. That would be a mess. Truth is the essence of who God is. Yes, he's love, but what's love without truth? Right? So, here's what Scripture says about honesty and dishonesty. I have to remind myself of this all the time when I'm tempted by something that's not God's will. Jesus said in John 8 that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. His language, he says, is lies. His native tongue is dishonesty. It's all that he speaks. So when I'm tempted to believe something that I know is contrary to the truth that God has spoken, I'm reminded that's a lie, that's a deception. It's not just an alternative that I'm going to kind of weigh against what God says. I can't trust any of it. Those messages are all lies. Satan only speaks one language. It's not like he got a little bit of it wrong, but he's got some stuff right. No, it's all lies. And that's his nature. God's nature is that he cannot lie. He cannot lie. We see that in Hebrews when it's talking about God's covenants and swearing by himself and so forth. And so we have this idea that we have these two options. We can be honest people who are after our father in heaven, or we can be dishonest people who are after our father, Satan. We can choose to be children of one or the other. Honesty and integrity are essential and core to our identity as God's children. This is a really important lesson. It's vitally important. What happens when God's people are no longer trustworthy or honest or credible? Play that out in your mind. What happens in a church family where the elders are not honest, don't have integrity, aren't credible? I've seen that happen. And people place a great deal of trust in their leaders in the spiritual community. And they lose faith in their Heavenly Father over people who break trust with them, who aren't honest and direct with them. This is a real problem for us. It has far-reaching implications. And as we look at it, we can see that it's not just about bold-faced lies. And I want us to walk away kind of looking at the nuances of it and what it is that we need to work on. Um, so this is exactly what Jesus says. It's almost like in Matthew, because in the context, the Jewish readers or listeners would have known all of this. 
the fact that it's mentioned in Matthew 23 after Jesus talks about it in Matthew 5, it, it almost seems like 23 should have come first. But that's because we're not from that context. So we don't really get in Matthew 5 what Jesus is referencing until we read later in Matthew 23. And then we read in Matthew 23, we can kind of see why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. And this is what was going on. So Jesus is in his list of woes. It's a very encouraging passage if you're not a Pharisee, right? Uh, but if you have anything in common with the Pharisees, you're, which all of us probably do, you read through the woes and you get a little bit uncomfortable. Jesus says, woe to you, blind guides. What good is a blind guide, by the way? Useless, right? Uh, if you say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if he swears by the gold of the temple, well, then he's got to keep his oath. You blind fool. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gifts on the altar, well, that promise you've got to keep. Hmm. These sound like good religious people. You're blind. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? He who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. He who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits on it. So you can't play games like do we do that kind of thing? It almost, it's kind of preposterous, isn't it? Isn't it kind of silly? Like, okay, somebody asked me if I'll do something, and I think to myself, how do I want to answer? Because I don't know if I'll do it, but I want them to think I'll do it. Anybody ever had that situation? Hey, can you come to, you know, my house for this, that, or the other? It's going to be great, you know. And I'm like, well, let me check my calendar, and I'll, I'll see, or I'll talk to my wife, right? because that's like the perfect stalling tactic. What do I really, do I know right then if I'm going or not? Lots of times I do. Why don't I just say, no, nah, not gonna be coming? Because I have reasons I don't wanna share. Like, I don't enjoy being with you. You know, like, <laughs> am I gonna say that? I'd, I'd rather, the Steelers are on that night. You know, like, there's something that if, it, if I were going to tell the truth, that just wouldn't, probably wouldn't go over well, so I avoid it. And I, I had this person in my life that I loved, but he, he always drove me nuts because I would say, um, can you do whatever I need done? And he would say, uh, I'll do my best to do that. And I'm like, so are you going to do it or not? I'll do my best. Can, are you good enough to do it? Like, I, I don't know. I need some assurance that your best is going to make it get done. We have this tendency to, now if we say, I promise I'll do it, oh, well now that we have to do, right? My kids always say to me, you promised. Anybody ever hear that before? And then I'm like, I don't think I promised. <laughs> I probably said something like, you try to be really careful, like, I hear you. And we'll see if we can do that. And what they hear is, he's going to do it. And I know they're hearing he's going to do it when I say it, because it gets them to stop asking. This is really costly for me right now. You know that. So does that make sense? We, don't we play these games where we don't just give an honest answer? And the reason is usually because it's the path of least resistance. It's safer in the immediate, at least, to not give just a straight answer. And I think Jesus is concerned with our motive, not so much the fact that, you know, I, I might not be able to know whether I'm doing something yet or not. Like, it's not like he's pressuring me to always have a yes or no, but I could at least give an honest answer and say, I don't know, right? I have a lot to evaluate. Whatever. So let's go back to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount then, knowing that the Pharisees had this problem with developing these rules where they would say, well, okay, there's swearing and then there's swearing. There's an oath and then there's an oath. So, you know, there's pinky swears and there's swearing on my mother's grave. And you can break a pinky swear and it's really not that big of a deal, but if you swear on your mother's grave, like now you're reprehensible if you don't keep it. Or if you say swear to God, well, 
Now you have to do it. When I was growing up, I thought this passage meant you can't say I swear to God or you can't say I swear anything. Somebody doesn't believe me and I say, I swear, I swear, I'm telling you the truth. Why do I have to say I swear I'm telling you the truth? Probably because I'm not very believable. <laughs> I had a problem with my honesty and integrity to begin with. This time I'm being honest. It shows that we're broken, right? And Jesus says, if you say I swear, I don't care what you swear by. It's binding to God. And if I say yes, if Jesus says you can replace the oath with yes, and it does the same thing, what is he saying to me about swearing in oaths? It means I don't have to take an oath or swear in order to be obligated. I'm obligated no matter what. If I just say yes, it's the same as swearing by God. That's what he's saying. He's not saying you can't swear. He's saying, do you know every time you say yes or no, you are taking an oath, you're swearing? Because your word must be truth. Every single time? Every single time. Your word is yes or no. So when my grandmother would say, like, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Just say yes or no. She meant well, but it didn't necessarily... I kind of got the technicality, right? Like, I'm supposed to say yes or no only. I can't use another word. I can't take an oath in the courtroom. What do I do? I remember hearing that discussion among Christians before. But God himself actually uh, endorses the idea of oath-taking. But his point is you can't use oaths to cover up your duplicity. You can't be dishonest and use an oath to try to kind of work around it with different kinds of oaths that have different grades of, like, accountability to them. Does that make sense? That's what they were doing. We don't, I would say we don't necessarily do that, except we kind of do, don't we? It just sounds different. We have different colloquialisms that we use to say the same thing. That's why he says, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you've made. He's not against oaths. He, remember, in the, in the law, he says, you've heard it was said, but I tell you, and he doesn't really do away with those things. He kind of gives us their truest meaning. So this is the pattern in the Sermon on the Mount. So he's not saying never swear. But in this case, I mean, he does say don't swear at all, but why is he saying it? Because their whole swearing system was corrupt, right? If you go to a courtroom and they ask you to swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, then you can do that. As long as you're being honest. You just can't take oaths that are dishonest. And this was their habit. This was their practice. You can't make one hair on your head white or black. It's probably about age or youth. You can't control like anything. It, God is in control. You swear by anything that's not yours. It's all his. You're swearing by him. So verse 33 is paraphrasing Old Testament passages. If you read those, you'll see that God did indeed talk about making oaths and keeping them. And so this isn't something that, uh, that, that, we're not, that we weren't ever supposed to do. And the Apostle Paul himself says, as God is my witness, when he talks about his own claims. So it seems that there's not this prohibition to ever use terminology that sounds like an oath. So I'm going to skip on because I want to get to the practical and close out. Here's, here's where you have to, if you have steel toes, anybody have steel toes? then none of these things will bother you. But if you don't have steel toes, then one of these will apply to you. And I thought of like five more that I'm not gonna mention when I was getting ready to come up. So there's a few things that um, we have problems with that I think are similar to this. The social swearing uh, to lend credibility to our words. This is any time we say, can I be honest with you? Because, well, aren't you always honest with me? Like if. If you don't, like, do you ever say, can I kind of butter you up right now? Or can I, can I save your feelings by telling you something that's not really true right now? But might make you feel, we don't ask that question. We just say, can I be honest with you? But it, it does imply that we need them to 
kind of take us seriously on this point. Sometimes we say it because we don't think that they'll take us seriously because they're just so immature or something, you know? <laughs> like, that's not what Jesus is talking about. But if we use terminology like that because we want to add credibility, because our word isn't credible enough, we might want to ask the Holy Spirit, like, is there something about me that lacks integrity that I have to say things like this? It may or may not be the case. Exaggeration in storytelling. Look, this might be harmless too. This might just be because you're a great entertainer. Okay, maybe no big deal. But it might also be that you exaggerate in order to improve your own standing in a social setting, or in a business setting, or in the church, right? Or we get some details wrong in the story, whether sometimes just automatically, because it sounds better. I think all of us are guilty of that. Uh, that that's probably absolutely something we can relate to. Prayer promises. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you. I almost hate saying it. Because, and so part of what I want to do, and I don't do it as much as I should, but I've started to, I learned from a brother that I should do this, is just they tell me something and I say, let's pray about that. And I put my arm around them and pray. Right then. Even if it's an uncomfortable place to be doing the prayer. Because I know myself well enough that if I say, I just don't love people that much. To be honest with you, I'm just not that sensitive to the needs of other people all week long. I have to write it down. If, you, if I talk in passing to you, I ask the Lord to help me to remember those conversations I had, right? Because I do want to be prayerful about them. But if it's just in passing, I'm, if you lived with me, you'd know I'm going to forget those things. I can be getting ready to do something, and five yards across the, you know, the house, I don't remember what I was going to do. So it's... it's and I want to do that thing, I just can't remember it. We need to be careful with these. If we say it, we better mean it. Otherwise, it's, it's not a yes or no. Social invitations, I kind of mentioned that. I was already, what about evangelism? Do we ever try to like, kind of hold punches a little bit with the truth? Or like, not share certain parts of the gospel? Or certain parts of scripture? When someone asks a direct question even? Because we think, ah, they might not want to be a Christian if I share that. You think God needs us to do that? I don't think the Lord needs us to like decide what they can handle or not. If a question is asked, we need to give, pardon the expression, the God's honest truth, right? We, we need to not be calculating whether they'll like it or not. There's a difference between that and just maybe wisely following the Spirit's leading and saying, well, that's probably not the right lesson for today. I should share with them something else because I think that's what they need or that's what they can understand today. But there's that other kind of cowardly motive. You'll know it by the way you feel. It's fear, it's not faith, that drives us to withhold information that a person needs to hear. And that happens in evangelism. What about wedding vows? And we're all thinking, well, yeah, we all give wedding vows and we mean them. We just had, you know, was it last week or the week before? Time, it was last week. We were talking about divorce as an issue. Obviously, we don't take wedding vows. It's just a tradition. They don't mean anything. I mean, when you say vows in front of a room full of people, that ought to be it. <laughs> like, you ought to reflect upon all their faces and go, I can't break that. It's a matter of integrity. I said a vow. And whether they're there or not, God says that anytime I promise anything, no matter what words I use, it's binding and it's to him. Excuses. I make, a, oh, I couldn't get that done because I had such a busy week. Or I had this or that come up. You can always find something that is your excuse that will keep someone from being mad at you but wasn't really the reason. Ever have a sick kid and use them as your excuse? You could have worked around it, but they were the excuse so that you wouldn't have to... And, I'm so corrupt, I've thought like, okay, what's the thing I can use as the excuse that's not really the excuse because it'll sound like a righteous excuse? That's awful. It's absolutely deplorable because it's not true. And any lie is from Satan. Unfavorable business deal. So I kind of make a, a, you know, like a verbal commitment or an oral commitment and then like, like I get some quotes and I lead the contractor, I think I'm going to use them, and then I find out somebody else is cheaper. But I kind of, I know in my heart of hearts I committed to this guy. But now I found something better. Well, it's just business. 
So I can kind of back out on this one. I'd be foolish to go with the original one. Anybody ever have that challenge? Maybe another situation that deals with money where we're like, well, I didn't sign a contract. Oh, so that's, well, you didn't swear by, you know, the temple. You swore by, like, I never signed the contract. But we had an understanding. It matters. Finally, oral and formal agreements apart from business. We do these things all the time. When we say we're going to do something, we need to follow through on it, right? Uh, when we don't, it's, it's a problem because it destroys our credibility. And when our credibility is destroyed, what are we tempted to do? Start swearing by things to try to enhance our credibility. It's an integrity issue. I love what Psalm 15.4 says, the righteous man keeps his oath even when it hurts. It's a little bit of a paraphrase if you want to read it, but that's what it says. The righteous man keeps his oath even if it hurts. And that's where we have trouble is once it hurts, once there's some fear involved or some personal risk, then we're like, eh, how can I shade this a little different color so that it goes better? So here's our invitation. They come from Scripture. Peter says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. If we love life and see, would like to see good days, does that apply to you? It applies to me. That's pretty much what I want. It's a good summary of one of the things I want. So I've, I've got to keep my lips from deceitful speech. Um, anything that would deceive. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This was kind of a kickoff statement by Jesus before he went into, you've heard it was said, here's the righteousness of the Pharisees. But you've got to do better than that. And so for all of the feeling better about ourselves that we do because we can laugh together about the fact that we all have that problem, so we're in good company and we can go home comfortable because the other Christians have the same issue. We have to, for all of that, we have to pause today and say, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. And I need God to make me more sensitive to the fact that I'm dishonest. And I think it applies to all of us in the room that we're engaging in a language that is of the devil because our yes isn't yes and our no isn't no. And the good news is we had this sermon. So, at least in the church, you can say to whoever it is that you weren't honest with or that you have to give a tough answer to soon, you can say, look, I would have sugarcoated this or said it differently, but that dumb sermon, like you understand why I have to tell you this. <laughs> um, that won't work at your workplace maybe, but it, it should work here. Let's pray and then we'll have our invitation song. Father God, I thank you for convicting me this week. I pray that you will convict all of us of the need to be completely honest. Uh, we're lazy, Father. We confess that sin to you. And because of our laziness, we want to get through things with the least resistance. We want the easiest path, and it causes us to be dishonest. We're dishonest with you. We act like you can't hear or see. Um, we're dishonest with each other because we're afraid that we're going to disappoint. And so we decide to sin as the solution. We're afraid, so we're dishonest. We're greedy, and so we choose dishonest words. Father, our righteousness needs to be better than the Pharisees. We know that, and we can't do that on our own. So we confess our sin to you, and we ask you to just fill us with your spirit. Give us a conviction for those challenging dialogues that we'll have this week. Um, that you will give us wisdom on how to speak the truth in love, but you would help us to have total integrity because we're not afraid. We walk in integrity and that we can live without fear. Father, we thank you for being so true, being absolutely 100% pure in your holiness so that we can have this conversation with you and trust you to answer and to give us an honest answer and to provide for us. We praise you and lift you up, and we ask you to work in our hearts with this message. In Christ's name, amen.